Welcome to Old World Order Theology with Brian Newberry. This is Pashendi Gregis, part four. So we've already broken down the first three arenas with which the modernist uh, engages in. Part one, the first one was the modernist as the philosopher by Pope St. Pius X, who was was fighting against uh, the modernists within the Catholic Church, trying to destroy the church. Part two was the modernist as the believer. Part three was the longest, was the modernist as the theologian. And now we will be tackling part four, and we're going to go into the fifth one, because these are rather short sections. The modernist as the historian, and the modernist as the critic. When I say critic, the one who brings anything, brings everything regarding uh, the Catholic faith and religion into question and criticize it in a negative and agnostic light. So, yes, uh, Pope St. Pius X, early 20th century Pope, uh, should be noted that initially, I believe uh, it was, was it Cardinal Rampolo who was elected Pope? And he was actually a known Freemason who had infiltrated the Catholic Church, and he would have really... Uh, done some damage if he were to remain Pope. But fortunately, there was a clause that the Emperor of Austria can veto a papal election. So Cardinal Rampolo's election was made null, and in his place, Pope St. Pius X became Pope, and boy, did he take the fight to the modernist infiltrators, and he really forced them to go underground. He created a, an oath against modernism that every priest, when he was ordained, had to take which unfortunately that was abrogated by Pope Paul VI, who was uh, coincidentally the Pope who, uh, who really ratified the Vatican II Council and the Novus Ordo Mise, the new Mass, which is said in the vernacular and quite different uh, framework than the previous uh, Mass of the Ages. Uh, I digress, but... Pope St. Pius X was also one of only two popes who was canonized as a saint from the time of the Protestant revolt to between that and uh, the Vatican II Council. Only Pope Pius V and Pope Pius X were canonized as saints. And also, coincidentally, since the Vatican II Council, virtually every pope who sat in office more than a month uh, who has passed away, has been canonized as a saint. Saint Pope St. John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, John Paul the Second, and I'm sure Pope John Paul the First would have been made a saint uh, if he didn't die one month into his papacy. And you can rest assured that uh, Francis, when he passes away one day, will be uh, canonized as a saint. Uh, Benedict the Sixteenth may or may not be because he's one of the more conservative popes, uh, perhaps he will, because he did early on in his career, uh, st uh, he stressed and emphasized the uh, hermeneutic of continuity of the Vatican II Council with the previous 20 councils. Uh, pope St. Pius X uh, is quite a contrast with uh, the other popes uh, uh, after the Vatican II Council. In fact, uh, being the only Pope who was canonized in the 20th century and in previous three centuries prior to that, uh, it's a striking uh, absence of any quote from St. Pius X in the New Catechism of the Catholic Church. You have quotes from many different places, lots from John Paul II, lots from the Vatican II Council, uh, but mysteriously no quotes from Pope Pius X and the new catechism of the Catholic Church. Why? You can only speculate, but it is a glaring absence. Okay, I don't want to get too far off into a tangent on that. I just wanted to give some background about who Pope St. Pius X was. So without further ado, let's get into the text here. Uh, Pascendi Gregis, uh, section 4, the Modernist as the Historian. Quote, Certain of the modernists who have given themselves over to composing history seem especially solicitous, lest they, believed, lest they be believed to be philosophers. Why, they even profess to be entirely without experience of philosophy. 
This they do with consummate astuteness, lest, for example, anyone think that they are imbued with the prejudiced opinions of philosophy, and for this reason, as they say, are not at all objective. Yet the truth is that their history of criticism bespeaks pure philosophy, and whatever conclusions are arrived at by them are derived by right reasoning from their philosophic principles. This is indeed easily apparent to one who reflects. The first three canons of such historians and critics, as we have said, are those same principles which we adduced from the philosophers above, namely agnosticism, the theorem of the transfiguration of things by faith, and likewise another which it seemed could be called disfiguration. Let us now note the consequences that come from them individually. According to agnosticism, history, just as science, is concerned only with phenomena. Therefore, just as God, so any divine intervention in human affairs must be relegated to faith as belonging to it alone. Thus, if anything occurs consisting of a double element, divine and human, such as our Christ, the Church, the sacraments, and many others of this kind, there will have to be a division and separation, so that what was human may be assigned to history and what divine assigned to faith. Thus the distinction common among the modernists between the Christ of history and the Christ of faith, the church of history and the church of faith, the sacraments of history and the sacraments of faith, and other similar distinctions in general. Then this human element itself, which we see the historian assume for himself, must be mentioned, such as appears in documents raised above historical conditions by faith through transfiguration. So the additions made by faith must be in turn be dissociated and relegated to faith itself and to the history of faith. So when Christ is being discussed, whatever surpasses the natural condition of man, as is shown by psychology or has been raised out of the place and the time in which he lived, must be dissociated. Close quote. Stop right there. So what he means by agnosticism in, as it relates to history, just as it relates to philosophy, it cannot be assumed by the historian that anything supernatural ever uh, crosses path with natural history. So you really have to interpret history in the framework of naturalism, meaning only things which occur by nature, a phenomenon that happens by nature. So anything miraculous, we, we cannot include that uh, within the realm of natural human history. Uh, God intervening supernaturally, uh, we cannot include that in our natural uh, assumption of history. Uh, you know, so Christ uh, changing water into wine, uh, we can't include that. That's too supernatural. That can't be historical. That that belongs to faith. So just as they believe that there should be separation of church and state, they also believe that there must be a separation of natural and supernatural. They cannot exist together. So Jesus Christ, according to history, cannot be fully God and truly man. He can only be man because the God part, the divine part, must be separated and assigned to faith. You can't study history that way, so the modernist thinks. So that's why you have a whole section of scholarship, biblical scholarship, called the historical Jesus movement. Some of them are Catholics, and they have to decide which parts of the gospel are supernatural and are assigned to faith, and which parts of the gospel are purely historical in the naturalistic sense. So in that sense, it becomes agnostic, because agnostic literally means without knowing, because we can't measure supernaturality, you see. You can't measure miracles. You can't measure the divine. We can only measure uh, what can be measured by humans. We can only measure the material matter. We can't measure uh, anything supernatural. So therefore, because we can't measure it, we can't use the scientific method, you see, to analyze it. And if we can't use the scientific method to analyze it, then we can't uh, analyze it at all, so the modernists think. So we can't believe any biblical text in its supernatural element. We have to kind of strip it of that and reduce it to its lowest naturalistic uh, agnostic even denominator and really you're just assigning religion and faith a an inferior position and that's why you have the attitude that faith and religion is inferior because you can't analyze it using the modernistic scientific method and so forth 
Okay, so that pretty much explains that. Okay, continuing. Quote, Besides, in accord with the third principle of philosophy, those things also, which do not pass beyond the field of history, they view through a sieve, as it were, and eliminate all and relegate likewise to faith, which in their judgment, as they say, are not in the logic of facts or suited to the characters. Thus they do not will that Christ said those things which appear to exceed the capacity of the listening multitude. Hence from, a, from his real history they delete and transfer to faith all his allegories that occur in his discourses. Perhaps we shall ask by what law these matters are dissociated, from the character of man, from the condition which he enjoyed it in the state, from his education, from the complexus of the incidents of any fact, and a word, if we understand well, from a norm which finally at some time recedes into the merely subjective. They aim, of course, themselves to take on the character of Christ, as it were, and to make it their own. Whatever in like circumstances they would have done, all this they transfer to Christ. Thus then to conclude a priori, and to according to certain principles of philosophy, which they in truth hold but profess to ignore, they affirm that Christ, in what they call real history, is not God and never did anything divine. Indeed, that he did, and said as a man, what they themselves attribute to him, the right of doing and saying, taking themselves back to his times. Close quote. Okay, so that concludes the historical section. So what Pope Pius X is saying, that they deny any bias or any subjectivity or any favoring philosophy, but in fact that is false, and by them saying that, they're being dishonest. Because by eliminating all things supernatural and stripping Christ, uh, the, the Christ of faith and the Christ of divinity, by stripping it and only focusing on the natural, they are actually practicing a certain philosophical framework in doing so. So, in fact, you can't really do anything without you can't do anything of intellectual value without some kind of philosophical framework. So if anybody says that they're, they aren't being philosophical, but yet they're doing something intellectual, they're being analytical, you can't do those things without philosophy. So when someone tries to say that they're not, that they're either not being honest or, or they're just uh, incompetent and you shouldn't listen to them anyway. Uh, because you have to decide how are you going to study a thing, and in order to do that, you have to apply some philosophical method. That just goes without saying. And by doing so, by judging Christ to be only a human historical figure, they are actually uh, taking certain, some kind of divine presupposition uh, themselves by doing so. Quite dangerous, even blasphemous. Okay, continuing uh, section five, the modernist as the critic, uh, especially the historical critic. Quote, Moreover, as history receives its conclusions from philosophy, so criticism takes its conclusions from history. For the critic, following the indications furnished by the historian, divides documents in two ways. Whatever is left after the threefold elimination just mentioned he assigns to real history. The rest he delegates, delegates to the history of faith, or internal history, internal meaning internal to the person. For they distinguish sharply between these two histories, the history of faith, and this we wish to be well noted, they oppose to the real history as it is real. Thus, as we have already said, the two Christs, one real, the other who never was in fact but pertains to faith, one who lived in a certain place and in a certain age, another who is found only in the pious commentaries of faith. Such, for example, is the Christ whom the Gospel of John presents, which according to them is nothing more or less than a meditation. But the domination... I have to stop there, close quote. The Gospel of John... The, the modernists like to think of the Gospel of John as something mystical and worth meditation on. Why do they do that? Because the Gospel of John makes the most explicit claims to the divinity of Jesus, being the second person of the Trinity uh, by, by implication and being fully God and truly man by, explicitly. So they like to say that that is a later meditation on Christ and the historical Jesus is rarely, if at all, present in the Gospel of John. Ironically, uh, the, the, most, the Gospel with the most uh, 
historical evidence uh, and archaeological evidence uh, of, all, of the four, John has more. So they try to take the history, the historical uh, credibility away from the Gospel of John, but yet uh, the archaeolo archaeological and historical evidence for the Gospel of John, is, there's more of it than the other three Gospels. So that's, that's ironic. It's almost like, uh, you know, all you got to do is dig and you'll find the evidence for God, so to speak. Okay, continuing, quote, But the domination of philosophy over history is not ended with this. After the documents have been distributed in a twofold manner, the philosopher is again on hand with his dogma of vital eminence. See the other videos on this uh, uh, Pashendi Gregis for the definition of the vital eminence, the God in here. And he declares, continuing, quote, quote, he declares that all things in the history of the church are to be explained by vital emanation, but either the cause or the condition of vital emanation is to be placed in some need or want. Therefore, too, the fact must be conceived after the need, and the one is historically posterior to the other, close quote. So what they're saying is the Christ and the uh, Christianity of faith is produced only by the interior need of the individual believer. Uh, and it, it doesn't come from outside. God doesn't reveal it supernaturally to all people equally in, in an objective way that applies to all. He, uh, An individual has a religious or spiritual need, and then what the need is, it is interior, interiorly meditated upon and decided to be true by the individual based on need. That's what vital eminence is. It's God revealing things through the individual's experience and the individual need in this case. So the individual has a need for his faith to be real and historical. So therefore, the historical evidence for Jesus Christ and for the Catholic Church, it exists for the individual because it is needed to exist for the individual to be real. But for other believers, they might not care, you know, not give one hoot about uh, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ, for example. They might not care at all for the traditions of the church and the history uh, of the apostles and their successors, the pope and the bishops. They might not care about that. They might not need that for them to believe and to have faith. So therefore, it's irrelevant to them, which is very bad for apologetics uh, as a, an aside. Continuing, quote, why then the historian at all? Having scrutinized the documents again, either those that are contained in the sacred books or have been introduced from elsewhere, he draws up from them an index of the particular needs which relate not only to dogma but to liturgy and other matters which have had a place one after the other in the church. He hands over the index so made to the critic. Now he, the critic, takes in hand the documents which are devoted to the history of faith and he so arranges them by age by age that they correspond one by one with the index submitted, always mindful of the precept that the fact is preceded by the need, and the need by the fact. Certainly it may at times happen that some parts of the Bible, as for example the epistles, are the fact itself created by the need. Yet whatever it is, the law is that the age of any document is not to be determined otherwise than by the age of any need that has arisen in the church." Close quote. So they're saying that for the modernists, everything is uh, it's prodded by the need either of the individual himself or the collection of individuals. So if there's some kind of crisis in doctrine, there's a need, so therefore there's a council, and the council decides the matter so that there will no longer be a crisis in the church at that time. And therefore, the dogma arises for the sake of unity and for peace of mind for the church as a whole. But the modernist by no means says that the dogma that came out of that need and that council pertains to all people at all times, because the modernist doesn't believe that truth is static or that God is immutable and, and that he would uh, declare a truth externally and from his transcendence that would be equally applicable to all believers at all times in the same exact way. Continuing, quote, Besides, a distinction must be made between the origin of any fact and the development of the same. 
For what can be born on one day takes on growth only with the passage of time. For this reason, the critic must, as we have said, again divide the documents already distributed through the ages, separated the ones which have to do with the origin of the thing and those which pertain to its development, and he must, in turn, arrange them by periods of time. Then again there is place for the philosopher, who enjoins upon the historian at, so as to exercise his zeal as the precepts and laws of evolution prescribe. Thereupon the historian examines the documents again, examines carefully the circumstances and conditions which the church has experienced for period after period, her conserving power, the needs both internal and external which have stimulated her to progress, the obstacles which have been in her way, in a word, everything whatsoever which helps to determine how the laws of evolution have been kept. Finally, after this, he describes the history of the development in broad outlines, as it were. The critic comes in and adapts the rest of the documents. He applies his hand to writing. The history is finished. Now we ask, to whom is this history to be ascribed? To the historian or to the critic? Surely to neither, but to the philosopher. The whole business is carried on through a prioriism, meaning what is believed beforehand, and indeed by an a prioriism reeking with heresy. Surely such men are to be pitied, of whom the apostle Paul would have said, They become vain in their thoughts, professing themselves to be wise, they became fool. fools. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. But yet they move us to anger when they accuse the church of so confusing and changing documents, that they may testify to her advantage. Surely they charge the church with that for which they feel that they themselves are openly condemned by their own conscience. Close quote. Okay, so what the critic does, you know, the, the modernist changes hats. So one minute he's a philosopher, the next minute he's an historian, the next minute he's a critic. So he looks back at anything, whether it be the Bible, whether it be a church council, an ex cathedra statement, and whatsoever, because the a priori assumption of the modernist is evolution and phenomenalism. Everything happens uh, by chaos. Ch chaos is the norm, and chaos is necessary for things to make progress and to evolve. So therefore, just because something was decreed and declared to be infallible at one time doesn't necessarily it is equally infallible at all times. So the critic goes in and says, and examines what caused those events which led to the dogma, what caused those events that caused them to be written in scripture and inspired by God so, so that the church could have something to believe in. So they examine the cause of those things and they determine that what caused those things no longer are an issue today, they're no longer relevant. So therefore, the conclusion of what, is, of what caused those things the conclusion is also irrelevant because that which caused them no longer exists, you see, or is no longer relevant. So therefore, we can kind of ignore dogmas. We can kind of ignore the Bible if it doesn't pertain to our current situation. And they might say it's nice as an individual might need it for their own personal devotion and for their own personal faith. But as far as any academic studies, uh, it's only a study in history and it does not apply today. So the modernist thinks, because progress and evolution is the underlying philosophical principle in modernism. Okay, continuing, quote, furthermore, as a result of this division and arrangements of the documents by ages, it naturally follows that the sacred books cannot be attributed to those authors to whom, in fact, they are ascribed. For this reason, the modernists generally do not hesitate to assert that those same books, especially the Pentateuch and the first three Gospels, from the brief original account grew gradually by additions, by interpolations, indeed in the manner of either, either theological or allegorical interpretations, or even by the interjection of parts solely to join different passages together. Close quote. And you can see this in the documentary hypothesis. Uh, if you want to see a video I did uh, on did Moses write the Pentateuch, uh, the documentary hypothesis slices and dices the first five books of Genesis uh, because they believe that five different schools of thought uh, later uh, put them together like an anthology and to make a single volume. But before, at one time, they were, uh, they were picked apart and were separate documents or schools of thought. 
The only problem with it, that idea is uh, there's no evidence that uh, separate scrolls or books of those particular schools of thought ever existed. Second problem is there are a lot of inconsistencies with that. And scholars today do the same thing with other books, with the three, the so-called three Isaiahs. Uh, they slice and dice that up. What goes to first Isaiah, second Isaiah, third Isaiah, an outside source later put in by some redactor, uh, those, and such and such. And, of course, the author attributed to those books couldn't have written them because they were only written at a much later time period than when the original author lived. Uh, they only used his name as a source of authority in their religious community, so they say. That's how the modernist works. They basically try to, to deny every claim, every supernatural claim, every claim of authority by religion, the Bible, and tradition. That's what they do. So that they themselves can be the, the authorities and everybody can bow down and worship their expertise and their intelligence. Uh, it's all about vainglory, all about arrogance, all about themselves. With the worship of self, certainly a Luciferian tactic. Continuing, quote, Indeed, they add that the traces of this evolution are so manifest that its history can almost be described. Nay, rather they do in fact describe it with no hesitation, so that you would believe that they saw the very writers with their own eyes as they applied their hand in every age to amplifying the sacred books. Moreover, to support these actions, they call to their aid a criticism, which they call textual, textual criticism. And they strive to convince us that this or that fact or expression is not in its own place, and they bring forward other such arguments. You would indeed say that they had prescribed for themselves certain types, as it were, of narrations and discourses, as a result of which they decide with certainty what stands in its own place or in a strange place. Close quote. So what they do is they like to cause a lot of confusion. They like to cause a lot of doubt. Uh, they, they try to make things so complex that no, not a simple person could ever possibly believe in the scriptures and the traditions in the church. It's so complicated, they say, this belongs to that. And, you know, and all they do is they write articles for other experts who are always disagreeing and contradicting each other. And you know, any person looks at all that and they're saying, oh, what a headache. Forget religion, forget Christianity. It's such a headache, it's so complicated. Look what these scholars have done. Uh, they can't even have simple faith. And it's done on purpose because Satan is behind this, and he likes to cause confusion, he likes to give people headaches and make things too hard. Uh, so they just say, oh, that's not worth it, I'll go watch TV. Yeah, good strategy, right? Continuing, uh, quote, Let him who wishes judge how skilled they can be to make decisions in this way. Moreover, he who gives heed to them as they talk about their studies on the sacred books as a result of which it was granted them to discover so many things improperly stated, would almost believe that no man before them had turned the pages of the same books, and that almost infinite number of doctors of the church had not examined them from every point of view, a group clearly far superior them, to them in mind and erudition and sanctity of life. These very wise doctors, indeed, far from finding fault with the sacred scriptures in any part, Rather, the more thoroughly they investigated them, the more they gave thanks to divine authority for having deigned so to speak with them. But alas, our doctors, with respect to the sacred books, did not rely upon those aids on which the modernists did. Thus they did not have philosophy as master and guide, nor did they choose themselves as their own authority in making decisions. Now then, we think that it is clear of what sort of method of the modernists is in the field of history. The philosopher goes ahead. The historian succeeds him. Right behind, in order, works criticism, both internal and textual. And since it is a characteristic of the first cause to communicate its power and to its consequences, it becomes evident that such criticism is not criticism at all, that it is rightly called agnostic, immanentist, and evolutionist, and that so he who professes it and uses it professes the errors implicit in the same and opposes Catholic doctrine. For this reason, it can seem most strange that criticism of this kind has such weight today among Catholics. And that was in 1907. This obviously has a twofold cause. First of all, the pact by which the historians and the critics of this kind are so closely joined, the differences of nationality and dissension of religions being placed in the background. Then the endless effrontery 
by which all with one voice extol whatever each of them prattles and attribute it to the progress of science. Science? By which in close array they attack him who wishes to examine the new marvel or his own, by which they accuse him who denies it of ignorance, adorn him with praises, who embraces and defends it. Thus no small number are deceived who, if they should examine the matter more closely, would be horrified from this potential sorry, from this powerful domineering on the part of those in error, and this heedless compliance on the part of fickle souls, a corruption in the surrounding atmosphere results which penetrates everywhere and diffuses its pestilence. Close quote. So that's the end of that section of the uh, encyclical. So he concludes by saying, the modernists act as if nobody has ever studied the scriptures before. They act as if uh, they're the pinnacle of enlightenment. And, you know, who needs St. Thomas Aquinas? Who needs uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, both doctors of the church? Who needs St. Augustine? Who needs, uh, yeah, fill in the blank, uh, St. Gregory the Great? Yeah, who needs them? They were men of their time, but now we've evolved and, uh, you know, upward and past them. We could look back at them and say, yeah, they were smart for their time, but now we know so much more. We have so many more resources, uh, and now we can see through th uh, the plain interpretation and the plain assumptions of the scriptures. Uh, we, we know how uh, various people who we don't know who they are, but we know various people and various communities and various schools of thought put the Bible you know, together verse by verse from different all over the place. And yeah, that's how they view everything. They they think they know, they, they have quite, they're quite the narcissists, quite the arrogant people who have to say that everybody was wrong who came before me, but now we know the truth. Yeah, and modernism leads into postmodernism. So tomorrow, uh, there's so many opinions on what truth is, then truth must not be real because no one can agree on it. But if you do, in co contrast to that, to refute that, if you do hold to the Catholic dogmas given by, revealed by the immutable God through the Holy Spirit, uh, you can hold fast to that. And we know that tomorrow, no one will come along and say the Holy Spirit is wrong. But with the modernist, tomorrow, you know, if they were wrong yesterday, then there's no saying that tomorrow will say that the modernist today is wrong. So that's the fatal flaw of their error. So please like this video, share it with your friends, feel free to comment. Uh, I usually respond to the comments uh, in a relatively short time. God bless you. Nomini Patris, Feliz Spiriti Sancti. Amen.